Okay. So this one is just kind of a recap of Bayes. I just kind of want to see if we can get through a quick recap of Bayesian. And just, to, it's just, it's, no, it's, it's no big deal. We'll, we'll get, yada, yada, it's Bayes, it's theorem. We've seen it. We'll do a little leveraging. We'll see what the data looks like. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to cut through this a little bit quicker. So we're going to see a little refresh run. Bayes likelihood and look at how it's actually affecting the data. So again, we've seen this in the lectures. We've seen this in the workshop. You've got your likelihood, that's your historical, um, systematic historical and perception thresholds. You've got your prior knowledge. So we usually that means we have um, prior knowledge for regional skew or quantile prior. So we've informed a particular a, um, AEP with preset frequency rain, rainfall runoff. You've got the normalizing constant, which is that fun you know, total likelihood of all the parameters and all your data, of all your probability distribution given the data, but then it's solved with the DEMC to actually come up with the probability distribution, which is the posterior distribution, which is the posterior distribution given all your information, your data, and your priors. So Bayes, in simple terms, is really just likelihood prior divided by normalized and constant. That's what it is now understanding that there's complexity within that, but <laughs> so likelihood function we have um, we've converted everything using ln to log so that we can add all this up. We have the the likelihood of the systematic data given given our model. We have the likelihood of the our interval, so upper minus lower given the data, and then we have our perception threshold, so the number of years of h times that upper limit. So that is our likelihood function. So again, it's the joint probability of the observed data um, as a function of the parameters of the chosen model, which in our case is LP3 for the most part. So let's, we're gonna look at this example just to kind of hopefully make some, this a little more concrete. So here's our example day on frequency. So just for fun, if you have this LP3 curve, um, is that possible? Is that curve possible given the data? Nope. So it, you will never get these data points given that curve. So given those parameters that came up with that, it would be tossed out. It's essentially a NAND value, right? Like if you... The data has to... Yeah, the data has to be able to exist. Yeah, data has to come from the frequency curve. So these, these data points up here, this will never get high enough to be that data point. So it's basically a NAND value. It, it's a non-existent value. According to this LP3, this data could have never come from that. So that LP3, if you're searching for it in your search engine in the bottom, as you're searching sampling, that's going to get, I mean, tossed out, right? It's a, not possible. So this one is probably an unlikely LP3, right? However, in the uncertainty of things, this data technically could have come from this curve, right? But it might just be unlikely. So let's, I want to, so there's a little bit of that. Let's do the various, go through the various inputs and, and see how they're influencing these curves. So, <clears throat> so let's, let's look at this. So remember our posterior distribution um, is a probability of the theta given the data. So an LP3 curve represents, so does the LP3 curve, does this LP3 curve represent the data? I think is what I'm trying to figure out. Is that? So could the data come from, from that curve? Yeah, could it? No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we have a short record. Maybe it could have come from it, right? I don't know. So <laughs> what it means is like what happens because we have a, if we have a shorter record, it's hard to tell, right? It means we have a wider range of possible distributions that could fit this data. So you know you can think about all these terms like all these different curves basically say like the data could come from it. Um, when you don't have a lot of data, when you don't have a lot of systematic data, if you don't have much to jump find, you just have a wider range 
of LP3s that that data could have come from. So that's why you end up with this wider credible intervals. So I think, <clears throat> like, <laughs> so again, just looking at it here at the 100,000, um, if, if you stuck um, like a PSI, like if you had a, a paleo flood, you had a PSI that ends up being around the, the, the 10,000 year, it's 100,000. If you had information about it there, um, maybe these, maybe this curve up here, maybe this one down here kind of ends up dropping out in the long term because it's just, you're, it's going to tighten up what you know about that um, area, what the flow could have been from there. All right, so let's try to cut through some of the, this, the, the other information. So here's some examples of leverage of a prior in the context of um, a skew. So skew here is um, gamma, by the way, and this up here is gamma. So in these plots, the, the blue area is our prior distribution, prior knowledge, right? And the red is our posterior distribution. What, what, what probability was would it come up with after you do all the calculations, right? So for this plot on the left, the uninformative prior, remember that's our uniform distribution, is weak. It's the weakest. Um, we have, if we have no prior, then the posterior skew is driven. It's going to be equal to, because it can be driven, it's basically going to be driven by the station skew. So if it's a really weak prior, so it's uninformative, then the posterior is going to be basically equal to the station skew. If you do something crazy, like give it a really small standard deviation for your regional skew, well, at that point, the posterior is basically going to be is equal to the prior. So that's that's kind of where the influence is. So if you tell the tell your model that you you have inf like you're absolutely certain what that that the the skew for your LP3 is the regional skew in this instance, then your posterior distribution will be the prior. So that means if you had like a skew of like 0.01 or something like that, it's going to ignore your, your systematic data essentially. So I don't know if that helps like understand the weight of what the prior is doing. From here you have, it's really weak. The, the data is driving it here. The prior is driving everything. So. <clears throat> So here's an example. If we add some new data um, to an existing model, so if we add some data up here to an existing model, um, what, what is that going to do? If we add it outside of the credible intervals, what is that going to do? Do you have a feel for that? Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pull the curve that direction, right? So um, basically like this. So, if you put it, if you end up with like a PSI or something or a precip or something that's outside of your curve, it's up here, it's going to go. So th in this case, it pulled it up. So you went from a negative 0.18 to a positive one skew. Um, the mean and the standard deviation didn't change too much, but it changed just a little bit. So now what happens? What do you expect? Now you, it's the same quantile, but it's. Um, same AET, but you put it in line with the data that you already had. What, what do you expect to happen? Yeah, so your, your generally your LP3 will not change very much, but your credible intervals will tighten up. So you're basically saying, um, I'm confident in my, where my natural flow, natural variability is. And so that reduces the uncertainty. So the here in this case the parameters really didn't change very much they changed a tiny little bit but the uncertainty is reduced so if you put it outside of if you're adding data that's outside of your current credible limits credible intervals it's going to likely swing it to that way if you give it any kind of standard deviation any kind of confidence if you put it in line with what you already have you're basically confirming your parameters and you're tightening your uncertainty with that either way you're tightening your uncertainty um so Looking at, let's see where we're at here. For this sample, we're going to look at um, adding the flow interval around a thousand year. So basically, again, just adding it in, in line. It's reducing the uncertainty, but it's keeping the, the skew, the, the, the LP3 about the same. So, but again, we add it 
I think we're adding it out. This one's added a little bit further out. So still just in line, but further out. So if you have the same standard deviation, essentially, and you move it further out, you're, you're saying at a lot less uh, frequent AEP that I still have a really good knowledge of what the credible interval is. So again, the, the idea is like, if you're keeping data in line with where, where your other data is, you're just confirming it, but you're tightening the credible intervals. But I don't know if you noticed, if you move it outside of it, it will, and it's pretty rare event, you're gonna move that thing, that curve quite a bit. And so just for fun, like for the, for the PTs, uh, for your persistent thresholds, um, if it's tall and short, your, your perception thresholds aren't going to do much. So we're going to talk about perception thresholds as kind of like a ceiling. So the lower your perception threshold and the longer it is, the more it's going to push down your curve. <laughs> and so um, in this case, uh, this case we're talking about a, 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 a around a thousand year um, paleo that's uh, around 144,000. But what we already know from the, 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 the data where you have the, the, the mode and the curves that we had is that 144,000 is more like a 5,000 event. So this basically says that um, we've had, we have not had an event in the last 5,000 years or 1,000 years that's closer to a 5,000 event. So that makes any sense. So we haven't had an, a, an AB in the last thousand years, that's more likely like a 5,000 year event. So like, you don't really, you're not really telling it that much. You're not, you're not saying anything we already didn't know. But so again, tall and narrow, it's a less of a shift. Now, if we squish the thing and make it longer, then you're saying, you know, here we're saying we have like 70,000 CFS over, over like a 300 year, period that's going to start that's going to start to cut into this where you already you're saying like you know what i really didn't have i really didn't have eighty thousand at this uh, aep it's actually a lot less frequent if it's a if it's long and short it's going to tell you that it's going to bend this thing over so essentially like so perception thresholds for the most part what they do is bend your curve right and down they're either going to have not, not much effect, they're going to either say nothing more than what you already know, or kind of confirm what you know, or they're going to say that, no, you haven't had a flood at this AEP, so shorter and longer than what your current curve is saying, which will bend it right. So this is more of an extreme case. This is a really long record. I think this is a couple thousand years of a really low flow. Um, so now that, say, a flow at 100,000 is now out here at you know 180 minus four over here is one just just shy of 1000 here so it's it's been a little over order of magnitude um just putting that in there so for your quantile priors we talked about like um you have a normal distribution so a normal distribution the the lb3s have kind of got to fit through that normal distribution so if you think you really know um that you have really good uh uncertainty around your or really tight standard deviation around your prior you can tighten that thing up and you can tighten it up real tight and best fit's going to do it it's going to calculate lp3 curves that can fit through a ridiculous um uncertainty around a quantile prior so out here is saying it's like you're basically saying i know for a fact with my normal distribution that the flow has to be in this range well best fit will calculate that and, <laughs> and you'll get a funky thing so the basic point of this is like, just remember your LP3 has to go through a normal distribution, unlike the interval data where it's just, it just it did the data come from that curve. This one you have to go through. So the tighter that standard deviation, the much more influence it's gonna have. Um, and so you gotta just be careful with your uncertainty with your, your quantile priors. So just in summary, BestFit does handle this thing as competition. It does handle multiple datas. You can have a high, data point from one source and a low data point for the other, and it will balance those, um, that data input and figure out what is the best fit 
LP3, the most likely curve, giving all your inter information. So you don't have to worry about the competition if you have different data. You just stick it in there and let it play out. Now, you might want to still ask the questions why these are so different, but that's a different, that's a different question. Best Bayes' theorem will handle it for you and, and give you the most likely value given this data. So, 